Hello and good morning. I'm Shelley Negrani, a member of this congregation and your worship associate today. Together with our minister, Dave Dunn, our music director, Alex Peach, and all the people who have worked to bring you this online service, especially our video editor, Mark Sewell, I welcome you to the Unitarian Universalist Metro Atlanta North which we call Human. Human is a member congregation of the Unitarian Universalist denomination. Unitarian Universalism offers no creed or dogma, but we do believe in the inherent worth and dignity of all people and the interconnectedness of all creation. We have no claim on the truth. Many of us come to Human because here we have the opportunity to engage in an open-minded and compassionate search for truth and for meaning, being mindful of the love we hold for one another and for the world in which we live. Whoever you are, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, whomever you love, you are welcome here. If you are visiting with us for the first time, a special welcome. Thank you for choosing to spend your Sunday morning with us. We invite you to fill out our online visitor form, which you can access from the homepage of our website, human.org. Someone from our membership team will contact you and answer any questions that you might have. Everyone is also invited to join us for a virtual coffee and conversation after the service. This is a great way to connect with the people that you've been missing. The link for the gathering can be found on the homepage of our website, human.org. I have an announcement. The service on January 31st will be an introduction to February Real American History Month, also known as Black History Month. The worship team would appreciate your participation in this service. Please consider contributing by recording something that you have learned about real American history that others may not know. Reading important words of an historical black person, something that moved you, taught you, or reading a poem that fits this theme. If you think that you might be interested, please send an email to me at worship chair at human.org to learn more. And now, take a breath, relax your shoulders, feel the surface below your feet, and become conscious of your connection to the earth. Be here now, sharing this service with your beloved community.
by Louis Van Leer. Let go of all that binds you, of all that burdens you, of what you carry, of all that shames you, of fear, of trespasses, of transgressions, of woundedness. Let go of guilt, let go of anger, let go of small-mindedness and pettiness, of ways of being that no longer work for you, of compulsions and consume of living. Let go of what you cannot change. Let go of regret of that which haunts you. Let go of pain. Let go of ways in which you missed the mark. Let go. morning. The late, great John Lewis tells a story about when he was a young boy and he was visiting his Aunt Seneva's house out in the country. And he, all the kids were playing outside and a really bad storm came up. And Aunt Seneva gathered all the children inside and there were about 15 kids and just one adult. And they were pretty scared. They were feeling quite vulnerable. And the storm got really bad. And it was a little wooden house, a little wooden plank house with a tin roof, not probably very well made. And the storm got so bad that the wind was actually lifting up a corner of the house. And Aunt Seneva grabbed all of the kids and told them to hold hands and walk to that corner of the house and these little bodies together walked to the corner of the house that was lifting. And they waited, and when the wind shifted, they would walk to the other corner of the house that was vulnerable. Fifty years later, when he was reflecting on his life, and especially the Civil Rights Movement, he wrote that during the 60s, it very much felt like that afternoon. It felt like the fabric of society was being torn apart. And that what they did, what those people, those people of conscience, what they did was hold hands and walk to the corner of the house that was most vulnerable. I think that's a powerful story. And it speaks to me right now, especially and it was exactly what I needed to read this week because I feel like right now feels the same way, like we're being torn apart. We have listened for nine months to stories of tragedy and death and sickness. We've been scared and we've listened to stories of cruelty and of racism that some of us did, could not believe. And then we had an election, unlike any we've ever seen. And it goes on and on. It feels to me like we're being torn. It feels like a very vulnerable time to be alive. And I've been pondering it a lot lately. Like, what is the meaning of all this? What is the meaning of anything, and it always comes back, a word always resonates, kindness. And it was in that beautiful poem that Sophia read last week. Kindness is all that we're left with. And it gives me strength to know that if Mr. Lewis, if we were lucky enough to be able to talk to him, he might use that story to tell us what to do, to hold hands and to go to the most vulnerable part of us. That is the meaning. That is all we can do.
Now is the time in the service when the love that binds us together is spoken aloud. If you have a joy or a sorrow that you would like to share with the congregation, please type it into the chat function. I drop this pebble for those joys not ready to be shared and those sorrows too tender to be spoken. May we hold one another in our hearts until we are together again. seems to be trapped by the same kinds of problems that afflict the rest of us, lack of information, weak beliefs, and procrastination among them. The difference between us is small, and in the end, we actually know very little, and almost surely less than we imagine. Our real advantage comes from many things that those of us who are not poor take as given. We we'll live in houses where clean water gets 510. We do not need to remember to add chlorine to the water supply every morning. The sewage goes away on its own. We do not actually know how. We can mostly trust our doctors to do the best they can and trust the public health system to figure out what we should and should not do. We have no choice but to get our children immunized. Public schools will not take them if they aren't. And even if we somehow manage to fail to do it, our children will probably be safe because everyone else is immunized. Our health insurers reward us for joining the gym because they're concerned that we will not do it otherwise. And perhaps most important, most of us do not have to worry about our next meal will come from. In other words, we rarely need to draw upon our limits endowments of self-control and decisiveness. 
while the poor around the world are constantly being required to do so. Philosopher Alfred North Whitehead said, the misconception which has haunted philosophic literature throughout the centuries is the notion of independent existence. There's no such mode of existence. Every entity is to be understood in terms of the way it is interwoven with the rest of the universe. Alfred North Whitehead. More than anything else, what we have, who we are, are to be understood in terms of everything else. We may have free will, yet that free will is exercised in a dependent rather than independent context. You were born into a certain situation, a certain family, a certain town, a certain place, a certain country. You went to certain schools. You were influenced by certain people, teachers, experiences, places, etc. Or maybe not. Maybe you were at the other end of a situational spectrum that you didn't have any of those things. You were raised in some different context. But whatever the situation. It was a context that was itself related to the rest of the universe. Georgia Senator Kelly Leffler, I don't know if she's the former senator yet or not, but um, many of uh, Senator Kelly Leffler's campaign ads in, her, in the recent campaign were peppered with the words, America is built upon freedom. Now, I don't mean to, to pick on her because many politicians from probably every political party have used freedom as, a, as the backbone to their campaign. And when one draws on freedom, they're tapping into these hero stories about the, the self-made man or self-made woman, a version of the American dream that's immersed with the idea of if you work hard, you pick yourself up by your bootstraps, you can achieve anything. America is built upon freedom? Well, the indigenous people to North America and the African slaves who were brought here might have something to say about that. Much of the wealth in the American South was dependent upon the work of African slaves. Maybe America was built upon free labor. We had a civil war to reckon with our myth of freedom and upon, those, and upon whose freedom or specifically a lack of it, America was built. The Union won that war. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified that eliminated slavery. The 14th Amendment was ratified that established citizenship and equal protection under the law. The 15th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified that guaranteed the right to vote for men at least, all men at least. Yet Reconstruction fell in 1876 and the ability of African Americans to vote, hold office, serve on juries, equal protection under the law, those laws were no longer enforced in an era of Jim Crow settled, settled upon the American South. An era of Jim Crow and legalized slavery, in a sense. Mass incarceration of people of color and legalized slavery. Yet the terror against African Americans was not confined simply to the American South either. Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement of 
the 1950s and 60s. And that movement sought to put an end to Jim Crow and reestablish voting and workers' rights. But the important point is that we have all benefited, all of us have benefited from the, from the protections that came out of the civil rights movement. Out of that movement became new uh, civil rights voter and worker protections that became law. The freedoms that we sometimes take for granted are dependent upon what others have bequeathed to us. These freedoms are always uh, infringed upon, seemingly at, every at all times in every direction. There always seems to be some kind of pushback. My mother-in-law was a direct beneficiary of the gains of the civil rights movement. As a married African-American woman with three daughters, young daughters, she, she held down a job and at night she got her bachelor's degree in education from the University of Indiana. She became an elementary school educator in Gary, Indiana. Her most famous pupil being Michael Jackson, who she remembered as being a nice, quiet boy who refused to take his hat off in school. Eventually, the family moved to Memphis, Tennessee. And my mother-in-law got a master's degree and a PhD in education at the University of Memphis. And then later, the family moved to Pittsburgh and she became uh, part of the faculty, education faculty at University of Pittsburgh. In the early 1980s, she went through a career change. She became an executive in the banking industry, eventually rising through the ranks to become a vice president and regional manager of a large bank in Pittsburgh. Then she became president, the first female president in Pennsylvania of a minority-run bank. Then she went through another career change in the late 80s, early 90s. She took a job as an executive at the Duquesne Light Corporation, which is kind of analogous to Georgia Power here. She became the general manager of public affairs. She served on the boards of the biggest, most impactful organizations in Greater Pittsburgh the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, the McGee Women's Hospital, where three of our children were born, the Port Authority Transit Board, which is analogous to MARTA here. She was the executive director of the Neighborhood Community Development Corporation. She knew how to get money into communities, to develop communities. Now, she didn't suffer fools lightly. You had to be on your game when you were with her. Her educator self never left her and she would repeatedly admonish my children, her grandchildren, to say that um is not a word. Yet none of her success, none of it would have been possible without the civil rights movement. And there might be critics who say yes, but she likely went to the front of the line due to unfair policies like affirmative action. Yet such critics don't seem to understand that affirmative action was necessary for her to get the positions that she would have gotten to had she been white. Now my father grew up in the working class Pittsburgh neighborhood of East Liberty. In Pittsburghese, they call it Sliberty. My dad was from down Sliberty and at. That's how they'd say it in Pittsburgh. He was in the, served in the Army Air Force in World War II, and he became a direct beneficiary of perhaps the largest welfare program in U.S. history, a program that still exists. It's the GI Bill. Now, conservative policy wonks would never call the GI Bill a welfare program, but let's call it what it is. It's a government handout. They don't have to give it out. 
It's a giveaway. Yet it's a good thing. It has enabled thousands, perhaps millions, of people to get tuition-free college and low-interest housing loans. It gave my father the opportunity to move up from the working class into the middle class. And I am an indirect beneficiary of the GI Bill. Now, the GI Bill is a handout. It wasn't given out to everybody because most people of color were excluded from the GI Bill. After serving as patriots in World War II, they returned home to Jim Crow and Northern racism. They didn't get the same benefits that my father was given. Elizabeth Warren says, there is nobody in this country who got rich on his own. Nobody. You moved your goods to market on the roads that the rest of us paid for. You hired workers that the rest of us paid to educate. You were safe in your factory because of the police forces and fire departments that the rest of us paid for. You didn't have to worry about marauding bands that would come and seize everything at your factory. You didn't have to hire someone to protect your factory against this because of the work of the rest of us did. Now you look, you built a factory and turn it into something terrific or a great idea, God bless. Keep a big hunk of the profits. But part of the underlying social contract is that you take a hunk of that and you pay it forward to the next kid who comes along. Elizabeth Warren. So no, I would argue that America wasn't built on individual freedom. It's not that simple. It might be built on the vision of freedom. The idea of freedom. But the reality is more complicated. Was America built upon then rugged individualism? Greed? Ingenuity? Exploitation? Wisdom? Who knows? Yet success and failure, for that matter, are not solo acts. Nothing is free and clear. Since the attack on the Capitol, I've heard people say, this is not who we are. Yet again, North, Americans, North America's indigenous people and people of color might have something to say about that. They might say, ah, yes, I've seen this before in my neighborhood. It's not who we are, as I've said before. Maybe we're just getting acquainted with who we are for the first time. Political activist Angela Davis said, the election of Trump is the last gasp of white supremacy. We've made progress on race, gender, sexu gender and sexuality, and this is the big pushback. Sociologist Randy Blazak, who studies hate groups, asked the feminist icon Gloria Steinem about the Trump cult, and she said, when a woman is being beaten by her husband, she is most at risk of being killed when she's trying to escape. And that's what's happening to America right now. We are trying to escape our abuser, and he's trying to kill us. Gloria Steinem. The good news, however, is that for those who, that those who attack the Capitol don't represent the 72 or so million people who voted for Donald Trump. Yes, he has his base, and yes, they could do serious damage. Yet the attackers, those who will commit acts of violence, are a small minority of that 72 million. 
And in light of all this, and I know that many of you may not agree with me, but I believe that most Americans, deep in their hearts, want to create a better society. We may disagree. We will disagree on what that better society might look like. We will agree, disagree on the ways and means to create that society. That's the messy work of democracy. We may all be confused and uninformed about those we don't understand. We may be confused and uninformed, uninformed about what it means to be an anti-racist or a patriot or a progressive or a libertarian or a conservative or whatever. We may not know what white supremacy means. But I do believe that the majority of Americans don't intentionally wish ill will upon one another. That's not to say that some people don't intentionally hurt other people. But I believe that the majority of Americans don't intentionally wish ill will upon one another. And I believe that this is good news. In the early 2000s, I was working in England for several months. And one day, uh, an English co-worker came up to me and said, you know what I like most about Americans? When they say, have a nice day, they mean it. Nurture our spirit, strive for justice, transform the world. This is our mission. We fulfill our mission with our commitment of time, energy, resources, creativity. Individually and together, we are Unitarian Universalists, building a world filled with peace and justice, love and joy. The offering will now be taken using the Givelify app.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we meet again. L. Rochelle Snyder writes, When I was 23 years old, I survived a traumatic experience that left me afraid of almost everything. For years, I got up many times each night to check the locks on the doors and windows. I refused to go anywhere by myself after dusk. I hovered over my children, keeping them in view at all times. They were not allowed to play in the yard or ride a bike or walk to a friend's house without me. But now I am tired of being afraid. Recently, I decided to walk alone in the woods for 30 minutes, hoping to make it a daily practice. I headed to the wooded trail when it was sunny, carrying a backpack containing aspirin, band-aids, a flashlight, enough food for three days, hand sanitizer, and a big knife. I walked tentatively, jumping every time an acorn dropped or a twig snapped. I ran into a web and worried that a poisonous spider had gotten in my collar or nestled in my hair. I was startled by an owl. A jogger came up behind me and I screamed out loud. Then I began to hear what sounded like a horse its hooves thumping fiercely. I came upon the source, a doe, who had gotten her snout trapped in a wire fence and was trying to free it. When I approached, she bucked and kicked with such vigor that I worried she would hurt me, but I got close enough to touch her and spoke softly, hoping that she could sense my kind intentions. You have nothing to fear, I whispered. I am going to free you. Her breathing was heavy and irregular and she did not look at me as I reached out and lifted the fence from her scratched nose. She gave one violent jerk backward, leapt over the fence, and ran away. White tail flashing, she was free. I kept walking, still in awe of that powerful creature, and feeling a sense of joy that I hadn't experienced in a long time. I'm pretty sure I was smiling. I was free too. Go in peace and enjoy your week.